<laughs> All right, today's class is going to cover the basics of the Endangered Species Act and what it does and what it means to the average U.S. citizen. Afterward, we'll go over some threatened species of our wonderful animal city. Well, inside and around Bexar County, to be exact. Wait, Caesar. Yes, my roommate, that I have to pay classes because I am a chronic people pleaser. <sighs> well, I guess I am hanging for myself. What is an endangered species? Great question. Many organizations list their at riskness to varying degrees. But in short, endangered species are organisms that are nearing their expiring date. They, as a whole, will go extinct. Huh. So it's like a species represented individuals. There will be people who are under deathbed. Great analogy, Chocodow. Many organizations like the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, have categories from vulnerable to critically endangered. But the United States Endangered Species Act uses two main terms. Unsurprisingly, one term is endangered, which I said before, is that they are organisms who are at risk of perishing as a species. The other term is threatened, which are species that are close to being endangered in the foreseeable future. So, continuing your example, Chocodile, a threatened species would be a person whose health is degrading and might have to live on a hospital bed into one of two options. The main point of the Endangered Species Act, or ESA, is to protect and propagate species until their protection is no longer needed. So recovering is, of course, the first option. The second option is death. The ESA was signed in 1973 by Richard Nixon, since previous acts were insufficient. They either didn't cover every animal or just their enforcement sucked. Data from 2006 states that 37 species have been delisted. And out of those 37, none of those became extinct. 13 recovered, so overall it sounds like a pretty good ratio. While the rest changed due to legislative amendments, so either laws changed or taxonomic revisions, so they just considered a different species, so it might have been not endangered anymore. There are many economic reasons to keep species alive, and I'm sure we can talk about that in another video. Scientists also, from the, the same data in 2006, suggest that around 539 species went extinct in the United States in the past 200 years. So the act's goal is to slow this number and hopefully recover ones who are in poor condition. The act protects plants and animals except insect pest species. No love for the no fun love for guy. The fun guy. <laughs> okay. As with all things, this act is not perfect, but definitely one of the strongest environmental legislations the states has. This act fundamentally keeps anyone from taking an endangered species, which the taking clause is defined as harming or attempting to harm an endangered species survival by any means. Projects proposed by the government and private entities have to take into account if they have endangered species on the property and what they should do to avoid taking an endangered organism. But this, of course, depends on what species we are talking about. There are also permits that some entities could receive that allow people to take a small number of species, so basically kill them. But these are difficult to procure, which is a great thing, honestly. Perhaps in the future, I will go over the specifics of this process. But for now, here's a slideshow of endangered species of Bexar County. I will show one of every broad category. Starting with the amphibians, we have the Texas salamander, Eurasia neotenes which is a small salamander 2 to 4 inches long, or 5.1 to 10.2 centimeters. The species actually is a collection of many subspecies that have variability of relatedness to each other with species of north of the Colorado River to be distinct from the southern populations. But for the sake of this lesson, it is a brown salamander that has some mottled patterns and is a case of neoteny. Neoteny is when an organism keeps a juvenile traits as an adult. So in the case of the salamander, the adults still have external gills, no lungs, and tail flicks. 
They need specific water requirements, including a stable temperature and flowing water to be able to survive and lay eggs. They feed on many smaller invertebrates, including amphipods, and in turn are eaten by larger predatory fish. Threats to their survival are common for underwater and cave critters, which usually is pollution and overdrafting of groundwater is their main threat. But these can be managed by cleaning up abandoned sites, improving technologies that keep leachate from landfills and tanks from leaking out, and making sure water is used properly and not consumed more than is replenished. Next species is the Bracken Bat Cave Mesh Weaver, Sicarina veni, an eyeless spider with reduced pigmentation. It was discovered in 1980 and named after the cave, which is a different Bracken Bat Cave that most of y'all are used to, and the person who discovered it, which is where the species name Veni came from. But sadly, those original caves where it was found were filled for residential development. However, fast forward to 2012, it was found again in a natural hole in the ground during a multi-million dollar highway construction project. The spider itself is around the size of a dime, but due to its endangered species status, it was able to cancel the project altogether, which really shows the power of the Endangered Species Act. In a general sense, if a project can modify itself without harming an endangered species, it can continue its construction. So in the case of this project, where they wanted to do an underpass, they had to turn it to a overpass, which of course cost like three times as much as it was supposed to, but at least the spiders were endangered. The golden-cheeked warbler, Cetophaga chrysoparia, are cute widow birds and are the only known birds that have breeding range confined to Texas. They breed in oak cedar tree associations and can be found in a variety of woodlands and thickets. During winter months, they dwell in higher altitude juniper oak tree associations. They weave their nests made up of silk, hair, and juniper bark in small trees. They glean, which means picking food out of things, invertebrates from foliage. Their breeding habitat is becoming more fragmented as it shrinks, and the golden cheeks breeding habitats of old, mature growth juniper oak tree woodlands take decades to recover, while their wintry homes are cut down for timber. So their main threat, obviously, is habitat destruction. And since they're confined to Texas, they can't really just migrate. The Cascade Cave Amphiopod Stygobromus dejectus are an awesome aberration of a crustacean going through troglomorphism, which is the adaptation to cave dwellings. The Cascade Cave Amphiopod is a great candidate for cryptic species, which is when organisms that appear to be the same are actually different animals altogether, genetically speaking. There, there's really not that much about this one, so I'll go on to the next cave critter. A lot of these are actually cave um, species, if you, if you haven't noticed yet, but that, that's most of San Antonio's endangered species. So the toothless blind cat, Trogloglanus patrissoni, which you could see in the first part of the genus name Troglo, that already should tell you cave stuff, is a subterranean catfish. Along with other cave critters, the blind cat has low pigmentation in its body, which gives it a pinkish white coloring, which of course the pinkish comes from the white mixing with blood. The toothless cat grows between 1.6 centimeters and 8.9 centimeters long, or 0.63 inches through 3.5 inches. This catfish contains no air bladder or eyes and is restricted to only five artesian wells of the San Antonio pool of the Edwards Aquifer. In its limited range, it can be found uh, at depths of 305 meters to 582 meters, with water temperatures at 27 degrees Celsius under great hydrostatic pressure. This fish restlessly feeds on any organic matter it can find, as its guts have been found with mud-like substances. Another invertebrate is a ground beetle, Radine infernalis and does not even have a common name because it's another cave critter. So have, it's, it's really not common in the first place. So that's why one hasn't been developed, but I shall call it the ant roach mimic beetle. 
It can grow from 8 millimeters to 8.6 millimeters or 0.31 inches to 0.34 inches and is known to inhabit 36 caves in north and northwest of Bexar County. Like the bracken bat mesh weaver, the spider from earlier, the beetle does not live in the water itself, but the karst formation near it. These invertebrates were not listed as endangered because they had any known decline in their populations, which is usually how we know like when animals go endangered. So take the American bison, there used to be millions everywhere, but they almost went extinct. So we knew that their population went down. They're higher now, but not as in their olden days. But with the ant roach mimic beetle, we have no idea like if it declined or not just because we don't, you know, it's not as obvious as a bison in terms of size and habitat. But they're endangered because in all the range that we know they dwell in, all their areas are threatened. These threats include contamination by storm water runoff, sewer and septic tank leaks, pesticide spills, and vandalism. Also, the direct development of San Antonio's urban sprawl can harm cave systems by digging and filling them in. Invasions, especially by the imported fire ant, could feast on them directly or by stealing their food. Cave species in general are vulnerable to change as they're adapted to an environment that stays pretty much the same, basically like air conditioning, but it's usually a lot hotter, and does not have much food. Plants cannot grow in caves, so food must be brought in by the external forces, so either weather, corpses, dung, or the scraps from other organisms feasting in caves. The invertebrates tend to have less young, live longer, and have lower metabolisms compared to non-cave relatives. So it's they're more case-selected species if you learn this in your science class, rather than their relatives, which are more R-selected. Specifically, talking about the beetle again, the ant roach mimic beetle is an opportunistic feeder, which you kind of have to be in a malnourished world. But they particularly like dead and dying invertebrates, probably because they make a easy food especially cave cricket eggs. On to the next one. It is the tricolored bat, Perimyotis subflavis. This little bat got its name because its hair on its back is black at the base, a light brown in the middle, and a dark brown at the tip. The wing membranes are dark while the wings themselves are pink. The whole body of the bat is small with a wingspan of 8 inches to 10 inches or 21 centimeters to 26 centimeters and weighing 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 ounces or 5 to 8 grams. They feast on small flying invertebrates usually over water and forest clearings. They are the first bats to hibernate in October and the last ones to come out in around April. Unlike most bats, these tricolored bats tend to be solitary and are nowhere as dense as other bats in their hibernation spots. For example, Mexican free-tailed bats in a really small place in a bat house, they could fit 500 in them. But these bats, they're like few, like under like 20. Not that they can't f physically fit, because they're pretty small, it's just that they prefer not to. They prefer deeper, warmer caves and only conglomerate with a relatively few bats in maternity groups. The mother bats give birth usually to twins and those fly off in four weeks. White nose syndrome is the greatest threat to these bats, but other threats include people disturbing them in hibernation and wind turbines. To mitigate their declines, bat-friendly gates have been incorporated to keep vandals out, while forestry services should have buffer zones around known roost sites. So what a buffer zone is, is just to have an area of a forest that is a gradient, so like the deeper you go in, the less resources you can take out of it. What was that for? To make sure you are awake. But mostly for my personal gratification. On to the mollusk. It is the mimic cave snail Fritodrobia imitata. Or imitata. That's, that's probably more correct. Is it really a cave snail? Yes. I am not sure why it's called an imitata. It probably something to do with imitating the stalagmites and tights of caves, but who knows? It's a really small snail. It is a phreatic snail, which means it lives in underwater cave systems in the actual water. That's what phreatic means. The mimic cave snail and other related snails are said to be primary consumers who feed on organic matter originating from the outside. 
But due to their tiny size and hard to reach areas, scientists do not really know for sure. They did find some related snails in case salamander guts, so that has to mean something. A determined group of scientists who wanted to find more about Texas aquifer snails found what is to be a new population of mimicase snail, but just in case, they call it free atodrobia cf imitata. Here is a picture of comparisons from the original mimicase snail, and to the right is a possible new population or new species. So you got to decide, well, it would probably be more accurate if like, scientists found it again, but you could decide for yourself if it's the same species or not. Also, what is cool with the snow is that it led to inspiration to an awesome mechanical art piece that you can check out in the description, uh, PowerPoint notes for this class. Okay, now we are on the bracketed twist flower, the only plant that is mentioned in this lecture. Strepopantatus bracteatus comes from the mustard family. The same one that provides broccoli and Brussels sprouts for your parents to force you to eat before you can eat your twisted puffy Cheetos. The bracketed twist flower is an annual plant which grows in rosettes. They flower in April or May, which they do so by sending flower stalks anywhere from one foot to four feet tall, with four petals for each flower. The seeds ripen over the summer until they fall and their parents die. The seeds can live multiple years before they germinate in the autumn. These plants prefer a narrow range along hillsides and tend to grow under shrubs. However, this might not be due to them requiring shade, but just because the deer tend to pick the ones that are often open. There are a few populations of these plants left, mostly on private property, and unsurprisingly, their main threats are development, the overabundance of deers, but another issue could be the cedar tree invasions that is also harming the widow golden cheek warbler. Solutions include fencing with deers and trying to establish new populations and suitable sites, although this method has proven to fail in the past. Buying the private land could technically work, but it will be economically expensive along with the ethical issues of going against American, specifically Texan, ideals of owning private property. This is another conversation for another time. Finally, we are going over the Kegel's map turtle, Graptemis Kegelae. It is a terrapin native to the Guadalupe River, including its tributaries of the San Marcos and San Antonio River, although it's probably extinct in the latter. They prefer rivers that have silt with gravel bars. The females grow larger, so their species can be from 89 millimeters to 203 millimeters, or 3.5 inches to 8 inches, in carapace length. Also, a weird fact is that if females eat too many mollusks, their heads can become abnormally large compared with their body. These turtles are known for their lime greenness, although they tend to lose it when they get older. Males can end up keeping their vibrant neonness, presumably for mating purposes. Kegel's map turtles are the only turtles that have true green in their part of their life. The Kegel's map turtle is an omnivore that likes animal flesh more than plant meat, and especially as a juvenile. Females prefer mollusks, while males prefer insects. Like with other turtles, the kegels are temperature-dependent sex determination species, which means different temperatures will mean what gender the hatchling will be. Also, they are the most southern native map turtle. They usually lay one through eight eggs per clutch and have two or three clutches of eggs per year. The turtle's main bane is habitat destruction, which is usually due to agricultural and construction runoff. This causes the water to become too silty, and although the turtles themselves do not mind much, their food cannot live in these waters, so the turtles starve. Dams and reservoirs also slow currents down, which again, the turtle seems to breed just fine, even with these constructions, because genetic flow is still constant, but their mollusk food sources need water to flow to live, so the same issue happens again. These turtles also used to be caught for their pet trade, but now businesses and organizations breed them captively, so wild ones are not sought after as much. However, an illegal activity called turtle plinking is when a person shoots a turtle who is basking for the fun of it. If I ever see any one of you do this, I will commit human plinking 
or inanimate plinking because uh, you are a strange assortment of life forms. But what the hey, turtle plinking is equivalent to getting karate chopped in the throat while you're yawning. It is just a real rude thing to do. The Kegel's map turtle was a candidate for a federal listing, but was taken off when legislation was passed to prevent shooting and protection. So it was basically saying, uh, we're not going to give you the title of a dangerous species because your legislation of your state already put these protections. But I believe it should still have been put on a list, just in case. Climate change and dredging of water bodies could lead to increased temperatures leading to predominantly female populations of turtles. Assurance colonies are becoming more popular, which is when endangered species are raised in private and non-profit groups, which can be used to revitalize wild populations, while also driving the demand lower for illegal activities concerning wild populations. This does keep the species around longer, not necessarily a happier life, but obviously it has ethical concerns for treating animals as a resource just to exploit. Regardless of all the issues and other solutions mentioned, by far the most important is to educate the public on these natural history icons. Every single life form has a story to tell and something to teach even if they do not benefit us medically or economically. Showing people the wonderful lives they share their homes with is bound to increase their appreciation and participation that they are able to continue to exist with them. With that, I conclude my lecture. You are free to go. What? That's it. I made top dollar for this class, Professor Caesar Chirosky. If that is even your real name. Well, maybe if my boss alerted me that I need to include the Dangerous Species Act in my curriculum at the beginning of the semester rather than two days before today, maybe I would have more content. And that's just my money I put in your wallet, Chocodile. Anyway, in the next environmental conundrum of the Anthropocene, Ecota class, we will talk about the Anthropocene itself and how humans have affected the environment over the last few millennia to lead to the sixth mass extinction. Cool. I can't wait to hear about all that doom and gloom. Right, Carl? Please don't talk to me. I don't want to be associated with you. Well, at least she said please. Alright, class. You're all dismissed. And those of you who take my Fabric of Reality class, or four course. course, in about 30 minutes, we'll go over copper and how it's used in biological body. So go scram and eat some food or something. Like, seriously, get out of here. Like, I already dismissed you. Caesar. How do you feel about the endangered species? Like, is it not depressing that so much life was lost to one species survival and prosperity? Well, talk it all like time and space. Everything, Everything is relative. relative. It is only as bad and good depending on your perspective. I'm sure both sides have great points. And we shall go over that in the next class.